I hope to make Mexico and especially Tampico safe, Tampico safe for American oil interests in 1914. I hope to make Haiti and uh, you know, Cuba a decent place for the National City Bank boys <laughs> to collect revenues in. I hope in the raping of half a dozen Central American republics for the benefit of Wall Street. I hope to purify Nicaragua, this is previously, previous war. Mm. I hope to purify Nicaragua for the International Banking House of, of Brown Brothers in 1902 to 1912. And he went on and he went on. And he said, looking back on it, I might have given Al Capone a few hints. <laughs> the best he could do was operate his racket in three districts. I operated on three continents. That's American capital, and that's behind those walls. So that was the first one, and the first lesson. Second one was the um, Spanish Civil War. And uh, in 1936, there was this Republican government in Spain, again acting in the interests of the people, um, collective, establishing collectives in industries, collective, collectives on the land, um, dealing with the economic crisis by empowering the people to take control of their resources and the land they, they lived on and the land they farmed. There were Western interests in Spain, um, British uh, properties, British industries, um, and when the fascist Franco invaded to, to, to challenge the, the Socialist Republic, um, he was um, he was supported by Germany and Italy, armed by Germany and Italy. Did the British step in to support the democratically elected government? Did the French? Did the Americans? Of course not. Of course not. They had wealth in them. They had wealth tied up. So their position was: we won't send you any arms at all. You're on your own. Um, and cargo ships stayed outside the country, so they wouldn't dock to provide resources for the Republic, democratically elected Republic. In fact, British intelligence actually supported Franco's invasion by getting the plane for Franco to get it. Now, this is 1936. Fascism is on the march. They knew all about what was going on in Germany. They knew about the racism. And they chose fascism. That's the British government chose to allow fascism to succeed. So part of history we tend to forget. And part of this whole struggle is to remember our history, recall our history, because then you see through the lies we get at the moment. And the way we celebrate the Second World War, standing alone against Nazis and against fascism. Well, three years earlier, we were happy to see the fascists win. And I think it's time we remember that and actually had a, had a cold eye on raw nationalist propaganda that rewrites history in favour of what some of us call the ruling class. The third war um, and was, the, was the war in Ireland, was the Irish War of Independence. And um, Ireland, is, again, as you all know, been a colony, was a colony of Britain since the Norman times when landlords went over there and took the land, or some of it. Um, and it's been a colony ever since. And there was a war of independence, struggle for independence over 200 years. And finally, um, Ireland voted, as one country, voted to, for independence, the United Ireland in 1919. A massive majority. I think it was 73 out of just over 100. Massive majority. Irish independence. We vote for it democratically. British response closed down the Parliament, closed down the press, sent in the troops. And it became a war of independence. And the Irish looked like winning it. So the British, led by Churchill, of course, old imperialist, led by Churchill, imposed a treaty, or negotiated a treaty, which divided the country into partition the country. And we, we've lived through that. And we know it's been maintained at the point of a gun for most of its hundred years. Um, and when you try to tell us that story, um, as we did, um, we got more abuse than you care to imagine. Um, the, um, 
we were we were called um, we were once called the worst propagandist and then you really started. And uh, then you even saw the citrus propagandist. Um, that was a Tory MP um, And, um, yeah. Well, uh, you might say that that's true. Yeah, she's a good filmmaker, but that, that's the world that we can say for her. Um, uh, the, um, the, I was asked, why do I hate my country? And, um, <laughs> and the, the Simon Heffer. The journalist on the telegraph, some of you probably, I hope you didn't read him, but anyway, just to tell you what he said. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I haven't seen the film. He said, I didn't want to see the film because I don't need to read my camp to know what a louse Hitler was. That was Simon Heffer. But the best one was Michael Gove. Oh, Michael Gove. Michael Gove. Gove. The trouble with the Republic, this was a debatable film, and the trouble with the Republican was they never chose democracy. Well, I think he was Minister of Education at the time. So <laughs> if he'd opened his history books, he'd have read that the Irish did, in fact, vote for democracy. It was the British that trampled them. So, again, it did, what, what's the lesson from that? The lesson from that is imperialists never give up. And that's the, the wars of imperialism are remorseless. So, what should our demands be? I, I was particularly struck by what Lord I said about the United Nations being not fit for purpose, and, and that's absolutely essential. The great problem with international law is that we don't have sanctions. That is the problem. The better of the law system, there is a, a lawmaking body, and that lawmaking body can usually enforce the law. We make international laws, but how do we enforce them? And it's only an international body that can be the policeman of the world. We can't subcontract that to the Americans and Donald Trump. And we can't subcontract it to Stalinist Russia either. The, which no longer exists, but we couldn't have even, you can't sub, We can't subcontract it. It has to be an international body that everyone, where every country has a vote. And I absolutely endorse what you're saying. It has to be democratic. Now, more learned people than me will have ideas how we can achieve that. But that's absolutely fundamental. We must have a democratic international body. Secondly, we need an international, we need a, a foreign policy which is based on international law and human rights. We cannot have a foreign policy like Tony Blair did. As, um, we know what's right, we'll go in all guns blazing mm -hmm. and the devil take the iron. We can that was that was absolutely a crime against international law and the million people or more who died and the four million or so displaced destabilized the whole region. That was a that was a war crime. If it's an international war if, if it's a, if it's against international law, it's a crime. And to me, and this may be this may be controversial. I think those people should be in the Hague standing trial for mm. their mm. Third. Mm. Third. Mm. Third. Mm. Third. 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 The um, I think is when when our country ignores international law, I think civil society has an obligation. It has an obligation to campaign for human rights. It has a an obligation to campaign against oppression, against dictatorships, against those countries that deny international the, the, the rule of law. Um, if we have to show solidarity with the oppressed, and I think that we have to campaign on that, we have to argue for it, we have to go to where the oppression is, we have to stand shoulder to shoulder with those people who are suffering. And that's a responsibility that citizens have when the government refuses to accept its responsibility to uphold international law. And we can all take part in that. that, that that's a collective responsibility. Now, as I understand it, the Kurds are asking for international solidarity to be shown in terms of boycott. Now, the crime is being committed against them is horrendous. We know it seems to be a form of ethnic cleansing um, from the actual ones, Turkish Komodoans speeches. 
that seems to be what they're about. Um, and if that is their call, then I cannot see why we should not obey. Because they are the people who are suffering. They are best placed to say, this is what we need. So I think you have an, an obligation to. And I think that's the, the tragedy is that, again, that, that, um, the training referred to in, in the, for the Rohingya, uh, in the Yemen, appalling, appalling atrocities um, happening. Again, we have an obligation as, as citizens to do what we can to support them. If our government insists on selling arms to Saudi Arabia in the case of the Yemen conflict, absolutely intolerable. The arms trade has to be, this is again part of our foreign policy, the arms trade has to be controlled. And we cannot sell arms to countries who have contempt for international law. That includes Saudi Arabia, includes many other countries. Mm. Another issue, uh, the responsibility of the Kurds, uh, the support for the Palestinians, again being referred to, one of the longest going conflicts. When the Palestinians call for our support, I think we have to give it. When they call for a boycott, to, 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 ease, to, to show the world that the oppression is not acceptable, then we should, then we should support it. And we should absolutely support the Palestinians in the way they ask. Because they are suffering. They're having their land stolen. They're having their houses destroyed. They're having their daily lives disrupted at checkpoints. People not able to get to medical appointments. They are being killed with impunity in Gaza. And Gaza is made into a hellhole that will be unlivable in, in a very short time. We have to support them with, with the boycott as they see fit to us. So there are those campaigns and struggles and we have to keep them uh, and I think, just to put it in context, I think that a boycott is a tactic because there's no point in, I mean, when someone's about to boycott America, it's not going to do us any good. It's a tactic that we can, that should be judged on its effectiveness. It's not a principle that you can apply everywhere because it's plainly a waste of time and not, not, not effective. But it was effective in South Africa. And, and that's, that was important to, to show that solidarity with the, with the South African with the ANC and the freedom movement there. And finally, I think we have to show solidarity with individuals who have struggled, with in individuals who are imprisoned, mm. um, mm. having sense of the Russian filmmaker I knew, knew of and who has just been released. Many, many people who, who uh, so I mean mainly, of course, political people in the countries where they, where they live. Prison, political prisoners, we have to show solidarity with them in the best way we can. Um, um, many examples, Camilla Shamsi, um, a writer, um, sh um, showing solidarity with the Palestinians in, in, in a speech in Germany, um, and her prize, the literary award that she was given, was withdrawn, withdrawn, as it was said to be racist thing that she said. What she was doing was saying, I support the boycott. Mm -hmm. And the, the Germans said that mm. no, we can't have that. So your prize is taken away. Shock. Um, and one other contentious figure I'd like to mention, Julian Assange. Yes. Julian Assange. Yes. I mean, he actually, I mean, we know we know a lot of things we ought to know and we wouldn't have known without WikiLeaks. And he may not have done everything correctly, and I don't know his whole history. But for him to be arrested in the way and for mm. him to be confined mm. and they know why he he didn't he, he, uh, he, he, he didn't accept the bail conditions because he was afraid he was going to be taken to America mm. where right wing politicians have called for his death and he faced his life in prison and in those circumstances he took refuge in, in, a, in the Ecuadorian embassy and for that um, he's now in prison been in prison since the beginning of the year. Um, there are no charges outstanding against him in Sweden. There are no charges outstanding against him in this country. And yet he is in virtually solitary confinement. And these are a couple of messages from John Pilger, who's a friend and journalist, I guess you know. Um, and he's written these two comments, having met Julian Assange. And he says, um, um, I can find it. 
came up with a bit of failure here. Um, um, I, I saw Julian Assange today in Belmont Prison, denied the tools to prepare his defense against extradition to America, his resilience endures. On Monday, he appeared at Westminster Magistrates Court where his epic fight begins. It's the fight for democracy. And again, more recently, John Rhodes. Um, I spoke to Julian Assange at the weekend. His psychological torture is unabated. He remains isolated in his small cell, mostly 23 hours a day, denied proper exercise. He has lost more, I think he lost 15 kilos in weight. Um, although approved, phone calls to his parents are still not possible. This is, says Britain 2019. I mean, the man has not been convicted of anything. Mm. He's being tortured. The UN rapporteur said this amounts to torture. Mm. Why is this? If, we can, if, if in our own country, a man is in prison, incarcerated, 23 hours a day, because he told us the truth of what the Americans were doing in Iraq. And we remember that video of, of mm. civilians being mm. thrown down in cold blood. Mm. That was because of WikiLeaks and Julian mm. Assange. This is what this is. It, this is how we, we we recognize the freedom of the press. The fight for that is the fight is fight for a democratic press, and it's this, it's an essential struggle for the rule of law. So that's one that we have to support, and it's a simple for all of us. So we've got a big struggle. I think there's, we can, there's things we can do with civilians, and the civilians, a civil society. <laughs> there are things we can demand of our next government. And my God, I hope we know which government we're going to get. Mm. Because we need it. Mm. We need it. That's international law and human rights. A regenerated United Nations. And an absolutely unequivocal opposition to violence to others. Thank you. Mm.